One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats onto the shore, left everything and followed him. It's fun sometimes to play I wonder what. I wonder what I would have done in X, Y or Z situation. I wonder what I'd say if I ever got the chance to speak to X, Y or Z. I wonder what was going through Peter's head that day by the lake. Try and get into his shoes. He's tired. He's been fishing apparently unsuccessfully all night. And all of a sudden, while he's trying to pack everything back away, a big crowd shows up. And this crowd is following this guy who up until now has kept himself where he should be safely tucked away in the synagogues. I wonder what Simon Peter thought as the crowd began to swell, so much so that this religious leader had to hijack one of Simon's boats. This is no place for crowds and sermons. This is a place of business. This is a place of work. I don't come to where you work and wash my nets and gut my fish, do I? Who knows what was going through Simon Peter's mind, but you can imagine something like that, can't you? Then this teacher, Jesus, who is genuinely treading on Simon Peter's toes, tells him to take the boat out a little bit further so that he can address the crowd. Honestly, I'm not sure if Peter and Jesus already know each other at this point. In chapter 4 of Luke's Gospel, Jesus has performed a wonderful miracle in Peter's home, but these stories aren't necessarily in chronological order. So maybe he does already know Jesus, at the very least, he knows about Jesus, and in either case, he agrees, and he puts out a little bit from the shore. And then, in this very captive audience sort of way, he has to listen to what it is that Jesus teaches the crowd. Five minutes pass by, maybe 10, 20, maybe 30 minutes, if they're lucky, and at the end of his sermon, Jesus turns again to Simon the fisherman and he says this. Put out into deep water. Let down your nets for a cash. Row out a little bit further. We're going fishing again. Now remember, Jesus has already interrupted Simon's efforts to pack things up. Moreover, this isn't Jesus's territory. This isn't Jesus's area of expertise. This is Simon's patch. He's the fisherman. He knows that because of the time of day and, and how the sun hits the water, that there's little to no chance of them catching any fish. That's why he's packing up and going home. 
Master, he says, we've worked hard all night, haven't caught anything. Too right. You tell him, Simon. You stick to preaching Jesus, and I'll stick to fishing. Only Simon doesn't stop there. We haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will. I will let down the nets. I tell you what, how I perceive this situation has just been challenged, hasn't it? That's how I understand the story should have gone, that at this point, Simon should have said, right, pass over the fare for taking you out and dropping you off, job done. On your bike, let me go home for some rest. But it seems like Simon's already perceived something about Jesus. That though Simon is the expert fisherman, he sees enough in Jesus just to take a chance, take a risk to spend some of that energy and effort in doing something that on his own he'd have decided was utterly fruitless. So, because you say so, I will let down the nets. And boy, if our expectations aren't just obliterated. They caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So great was the catch that he, he had to get others involved. He had to call others into action. Others who had, like him, been busy packing down their gear, getting ready to clock off work. He had to call them to join in and to help and to haul in the nets so that there were so many fish that both boats nearly sank. And it's at this point that Peter really perceives something. It's at this point that he perceives two things, I should say. Whatever the backstory between Jesus and Peter that they may or may not have had, at this point for Peter, something truly does click. When he sees the miraculous catch of fish, he bows. He falls at Jesus' knees and he begs him, go away from me, Lord. That might strike you as strange. But he's perceived in Jesus, in in this new light or this new intensified light, that he isn't just a mere teacher, a good and holy man who is due his reverence and respect. Peter's at least beginning to perceive that this is the one who has power over all things, even the fish in the sea. I think Peter's beginning to recognize that Jesus is God himself. And as he perceives this power, this majesty in Jesus, he perceives something about himself too. Peter says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. No longer is this simply a situation in which a modestly capable fisherman is showing deference or courtesy to increasingly prominent leader in the local culture. Now this is Peter, a sinful, broken, fallen, damaged man. It's reminiscent actually of the prophet Isaiah. We've heard from Isaiah a few times already in Luke's Gospel because John the Baptist and Jesus have both drawn inspiration from his words, his teaching, his prophecy to describe themselves. At the beginning of Isaiah's ministry, he has this vision where he himself is in the temple before God and this is what he cries out. Woe to me, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. I live among people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. For Isaiah, it was this coming together of the ultimate, the purest, the most perfect and majestic and someone, if truth be told, didn't even measure up against his own corrupted sense of good and bad, right and wrong. The perception Isaiah had, the perception that Peter has here, is that the two things shouldn't, couldn't, oughtn't to mix. That if they do, that might lead to ruin. 
of one or the other. You see, Peter now perceives himself and Jesus and it leads him to act in a certain way. If you are Jesus who I now think you are, and if I am who I've long regarded myself to be, then we shouldn't be even in the same boat together. But here's what's great about this story, is that Jesus sees things ever so slightly differently. Peter says, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And this is how Jesus responds. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. We refer to this as the calling of Peter. Jesus inviting Peter to be one of his followers, one of his first disciples. And it's the start of Peter being one of the key leaders in the history of the church. But here's the thing we need to recognise for a moment this morning. You see how Jesus perceived himself and Peter, which we'll come on to at the end of a couple of stories now, works itself out in a completely different way to how Peter perceived things. Peter looked and he saw who he thought Jesus was and who he thought himself to be, and he saw that as driving them apart. Jesus surveying, knowing the same two individuals perceived things in such a way that the two were to go together. Peter was to follow Jesus and imitate Jesus to become a fisher of men. Luke, who's recording of Jesus, his life and ministry that we're working our way through, he moves on from the story of Jesus and Peter to the story of someone else who has their own ideas about who they are and who Jesus is. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Perhaps just a bit of an explainer here. Leprosy at the time was a huge issue and it had been for centuries. It's a term used to describe a myriad, a load of different skin diseases which affected people to different degrees uh, physically but with this one common unifying effect, it totally and utterly cut them off from the rest of society. If you were a leper at this time, that meant that you were shut out, shunned, put out even, from normal life with your friends, with your family, with your neighbours, with your work colleagues. You literally were not allowed to mix or mingle with others. Such was the fear that whatever was tearing its way through your flesh would be passed on to the otherwise healthy and it would infect them too. And you can kind of understand that, right? If if someone has a disease, you don't want to go anywhere near them. I won't mention anything that's going on in our lives at the moment. But you see this sense of being vulnerable towards those who have this disease was intensified in Jesus' day amongst the Jewish people. Because under Moses, they had received laws and instructions that spelt out what sort of skin diseases should be made separate, what the way back in was, if ever there was, and so on. This was a physical health thing, but it was also a religious thing of staying away from impurity and uncleanliness. So this man who comes to Jesus, and Luke says he is covered in leprosy. This is no minor case. He isn't just someone who's hurting and suffering physically. He's someone who is utterly cut off, utterly alone. For goodness knows how long he has existed as someone that no one even wants to set eyes upon. That if someone did set eyes upon, that they'd run away that they'd want to be as far away as possible as they could from this man. How would such an individual, do you think, perceive themselves? Perhaps he thought of himself as someone who was cursed by God. 
maybe he viewed himself as someone who now was outside, not just of decent society, but outside of the scope and the bounds of being loved by anybody else. Certainly he'd have viewed himself as someone who was tainted and stained. Maybe he saw himself as someone who was a risk to others. And yet he does come to Jesus. He stands a little bit far off, I imagine. Forgive me. At a distance, he flings himself to the floor. And he says this, I know that you can heal me. You see, he's already perceived what Simon Peter found out on there on the lake. He says, I know that you can heal me, Lord, but I'm not sure you will. I'm not sure you'll want to. And all the time as he's lying there on the floor in the dust, Jesus has actually been moving towards him. And before he hears Jesus' answer, he feels Jesus' touch, his hand on his shoulder. And Jesus speaks these wonderful words. I am willing. Be clean. And immediately, Luke records, the leprosy left him. Point of note, I think, that Jesus didn't actually need to touch this man. There are plenty of miracles recorded um, in Jesus' life that happen simply with a word. Some miracles that happen even without being in the same region as someone. Jesus chose, though, not to keep his distance. Not to stay somewhere safe, as if what was wrong with this man would rub up on him, Jesus decided to come near, as if what was right about Jesus would rub off on the man. Do you see it again? How the perception that this individual had, both of himself and of Jesus, shaped how he behaved, how he acted, how he lived. And do you see how Jesus' perception resulted in something that is totally and utterly different? Luke moves on again. Another day, another village, and Jesus is yet again teaching crowds and crowds of people. It's not just simple village folk who are gathering either, but lots and lots of important, prestigious teachers of the law and Pharisees, people who themselves see it as their job to put the nation of Israel right, to help them get back on the straight and narrow path which leads to God's blessing. And in the midst of all that's going on, all the hustle and bustle of the people, Jesus is teaching, Jesus healing more people by a touch perhaps, maybe by a word, when all of a sudden there's a noise up above. Some friends have brought one of their gang who was paralysed to see Jesus so that he can be healed. Only the, the crowd is far too big, far too dense for them to get anywhere near the man himself. So they've come up with this ingenious plan of going up onto the roof of the building that Jesus is in and digging through the mud and the straw, lowering him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. And you get where we're going with this, don't you? The man and his friends perceive, they see, they view Jesus as a powerful one, one who is able to put right the problem in their lives which they perceive to be the most pressing issue, the one chat paralysis. And so they act in accordance with that. And then, well, Jesus acts. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, FYI, Jesus doesn't ignore this man's pretty obvious problem, his paralysis. This little story finishes up with Jesus saying, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately the man stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. But it's another story of someone who sees Jesus and sees themselves in a particular way acting accordingly and in how Jesus responds and in that response revealing that there's so much more to be known 
and to be seen both in the man and Jesus himself. And to take one last little detour before we finally land on how Jesus describes everything that's going on. Luke records Jesus heading down the road and spotting someone called Levi, a tax collector, sitting in his booth. Now this one doesn't take a great deal of imagination, I don't think, to bridge the cultural gap between them and us. Those people who take money from our pockets in the name of the government have always and will always be disliked. Like traffic wardens, being a tax collector has never been an occupation to brag about. But in first century Palestine, it really, really was a bad look. I think the Roman Empire, they've rolled in and they've taken over ultimate rule and authority. And in effect, they've auctioned off the right to collect taxes. So entrepreneurial types paid for the right to collect the taxes on the emperor's behalf. And as long as they collected more than they paid for the privilege, well, then they were quids in except that this made it a really dirty job in a number of ways. Number one, they're tax collectors and nobody likes having money taken off them. Number two, they're not just tax collectors, they're in bed with the enemy. They're doing the Caesar's dirty work for them. The uh, invading, the occupying, oppressive nation that is over them, they're now a crony of them. Number three, though, they're really known for pushing the boundaries of what collecting tax really meant. If they could squeeze out a few extra shekels, then the reputation said that they would. They were, if you like, like an upside down accountant, always looking for an extra excuse to have a few more pennies in the tax collection pot. So they are really disliked individuals for so many reasons. And Jesus is walking down the road and he spots Levi. And notice, Levi, unlike the man with leprosy and unlike the, the man with paralysis and his friends, Levi hasn't gone out of his way to find Jesus. Whatever he sees Jesus, however he perceives him at this point, it hasn't driven him out of his booth to seek and to find Jesus. He's happily, maybe miserably, I don't know, sat in his booth earning a fantastic living, even if it does cost him his seat at the family table at Christmas time. This is what happens. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his home. He certainly had the resources to do that. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. In this last story, I just want to highlight how Levi perceives Jesus after he's been invited to follow him. See how it says that he left everything to follow Jesus. Imagine the value that Levi must have placed on being near Jesus in order to give up everything that he had to be willing just to, to leave it all where it was. You could make a similar case for Simon and the other fishermen. They weren't just day labourers, you know. They were small to medium-sized business owners. And they left all of that to follow Jesus because they perceived worth in being near him. But here Levi goes a step further. It's especially noted that the one who gave it all up in exchange for being with Jesus now, now wants that to be on offer for other people. I know what I would do in a situation where I found something valuable. When I get a shiny new toy, I can get a bit selfish. The more worth and the more value something has, the more energy I expend trying to keep it nice and safe and all to myself. But Levi doesn't do that. He sees Jesus worth so much, gives up everything to follow him, but says to all of his tax collector friends, come and see and share. 
He doesn't want to keep this great rich treasure to himself. He wants others to come and find riches too. You see, Levi has perceived that Jesus is incredibly valuable. He's also perceived that Jesus isn't diluted by sharing him with others. He's not just a a pile, a stack of cash that when you invite others to come and, and, and to get their mitts on, it depletes your own stores. Jesus is one who will never, ever run out. doesn't want to keep this great treasure to himself. Jesus is a never-ending source in his eyes. I mentioned earlier that Jesus by now wasn't just attracting crowds of ordinary folk, but his ministry had caught the attention of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and their perception in the midst of all of this was so similar to Peter's original perception. If you, Jesus, are good, then what on earth are you doing, drawing close to, so near that um, spending time with those who are bad? It's in response to their question that we get this beautiful description from the lips of Jesus about how he sees all of these encounters and more. Jesus says this, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's not the healthy that need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here it is. The man who has already said that he needs to keep on moving from village to village to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. The man who's already said that Isaiah spoke about him being one who brings good news, who brings sight for the blind and uh, freedom for the captive and the oppressed and brings the Lord's favour with him. Now he's saying that all of that is because people are sick. Physically, obviously, but spiritually too. His perception of each and every one of us is that we are needy people. People in need of a doctor. And far from wanting to quarantine himself from us, he says, I have come to make them well. It's good, Peter that you have recognized that you aren't worthy to be in Jesus's presence, but you failed to perceive, Jesus says, the simple fact that I have come to do something about that. It's good, dear leper, Jesus says, that you've perceived that I am able to make you well and fit for civil society, but you failed to perceive that more than that, I have a purity I want to share with you from my very self to you. It's good, merry band of friends, that you've perceived that I, Jesus, am the one who is able to make your friend whole again. It's good that you're willing to go to such drastic lengths to make it so, but you fail to perceive that I, Jesus, am the one who is concerned not just for your short and numbered days, but I have a view of your eternal days, your eternal life as well. It's good, Levi, that you've perceived that I, Jesus, am worth so much, so much more than all the riches that you can scheme to collect for yourself. And it is very good that you have perceived that I'm an inexhaustible source, riches which can be freely shared with everyone else and still have an abundance. It's not the healthy, Jesus says, who needs a doctor, but those who are ill. I am that doctor, Jesus says, and I have come to call sinners to repentance. I have come to do what is necessary, not to offer a placebo, but to do the very thing that will make you whole, that will make you right, that will make you a child of God once more. I asked at the very start of our service together this morning how you perceive yourself and how you perceive Jesus. There are so many answers that you could give. 
you could perceive yourself as a sick person, literally or metaphorically. You could perceive you're someone who is in need of a doctor. You could perceive yourself more like the leper who sees himself as an, an outcast. Someone who simply doesn't fit in, can't fit in. Do you see yourself as someone who needs someone else to bring you in? Do you see yourself honestly as a sinner? As someone who is flawed and fallen and in need of forgiveness? How do you perceive Jesus? Is he the dead man? A pretty important footnote in the world's history but nothing more. Is he a holy and righteous and pure God? And nothing more. Is he meek and mild and loving and gracious, but nothing more? I tell you, if all those things can be perceived, but only those things, we miss the whole picture and we do not live life as we ought. We do not realize that Jesus is the one that we can come to to find restoration, to find forgiveness, to find healing, to find completion and purpose and joy. Jesus said that he saw the whole picture and it led him to act in these encounters in a pretty specific way, but in his life and his ministry more generally and specifically in how he went to the cross. You know, Jesus' death, his dying wasn't an accident. Later on in the Bible, it's going to speak of Jesus not scorning the cross knowing what the outcome would be, knowing what the wonderful results of him drawing near to sick people, even taking that sickness into himself, it would be life for anyone who would believe. How do you view yourself? How do you view Jesus? Do you have the whole picture? Are you being open and honest about who you are? And are you being open and honest as to who Jesus is and what he has done? I tell you the wonderful thing that Luke is trying to get us to see and I'm trying to get us to see this morning is this. That when we see who we truly are, when we see who Jesus truly is, it is good, good news. Dear Lord, help us to see those two things, who we truly are and who Jesus truly is. Help us to live in the reality of that, those true perceptions. Help us to be people who recognise and respond to the reality of Jesus Christ. Amen.